vaccine our community can use your wisdom uh william entrican i guess uh two of uh the erc can, that is presenting today uh list uh, erc 721 as uh the dependency uh so obviously they care about what you uh think adrian uh is now the main developer uh or as i would like to uh, refer to as the main culprit uh, people to blame if something goes wrong with everyone's small contract, Open Zeppelin. Um, and then uh, we also have uh, the team uh, of uh, Zero Acme, and then um, we have um, Vectorized, uh, who I was, was uh, at least uh, I know you uh, because I respect the, the work you've done for DRC721A and Saladi. Um, and uh, also we have uh, a group of people. I'd like to thank you for joining today. Um, it's a good new season to, to build. My name is Victor. Uh, I'm one of the EIP ERC editor. Specifically in this group, I like to mention that uh, EIP editors also cover ERC. Uh, we still believe, and William and I still believe that this should be one community. Uh, but obviously there's, uh, separation of work, for example, uh, consensus layer and execution layer. There are uh, people who work more closer and they argue more fiercely because they need to come up with consensus what to include in the next hard work. Uh, in, instead, uh, our, in our community of ERCs, you can choose to adopt or not. Uh, that's all by you. It's a very soft requirement, but it also means uh, once you achieve the kind of consensus, you, this is actually uh, a great thing to evolve. Uh, I think before ERC721 was uh, kind of standardized, there were five uh, different proposals. Uh, and then if you are a wallet builder, that's a disaster. Uh, now that with uh, some standardization, people have consensus, uh, Open Zeppelin are able to kind of adopt, uh, or other uh, Solati were able to adopt, and then every DApp app, D -app builder can use your uh, library, and then wallet would Reds are sure if they build something, it will be it will work. So that's the that's the the kind of spirit in the in the in the whole thing of ERCs. Um, so I hope that by building a community uh, that could bring uh, all authors and adopters in the room, uh, it would be a good idea. Uh, it would be good for you for authors to better improve your ERCs and also for adopters to choose to give your feedback. Uh, especially if you are author who already author something that is adopted, um, I hope that you don't feel that your work is done. Uh, I think that uh, the more you can contribute back to the community uh, by giving you opinion and feedback, uh, the better you can advance your vision. Uh, so that's basically the idea. So we're resuming this. It would be I. Uh, it would be bi-weekly, and then we also usually hold offline meetups like the one that Hadrian really like <laughs> in Dev Connect uh, and other things. So uh, let's um, get started. If you haven't joined uh, the Discord and Telegram, please, uh, we love to have you there. Uh, you can just join or stay in touch. Uh, we can ping you for future. And if you are more of an email guy uh, or gal, uh, there's a mailing list too. And then we have our Twitter, so um, I'll send you more information on this. We love to bring you all together. It's very hard to, to find people who really care about open interoperability, but I think in this room, we all do. So thank you so much for being here. A very special guest who just, just joined, and I think Hadrian knows you better, knows, knows better than anyone else, uh, our friend uh, Fran Frangio, Francisco Giordano, I, I I don't know if you guys have have talked ever since, uh, but hey, Francisco, thank you be for being here. Um, Francisco uh, was a main developer for Open Zeppelin before he left, and he's working on some academic language programming. I don't know about whether that's ZK or AI. I think Francisco, you can share later. But uh, yeah, we have a tight schedule to today. Uh, let's get started uh, with the agenda. Um, and each item, I'm hoping that we can kind of use 10 minutes for them. Um, that means you can either use five minutes to present and five minutes for Q&A, or you can like divide however it. I, I hope that you can leave some time for comments. 
but the main goal is not to kind of get the draft fully resolved but bring it to a people's attention especially the high quality high quality kind of attention so that would be it. and by the way lily is here lily and i will be operating the, uh, the 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 this conference onwards and then we look forward to more contributors so let me turn over the first one would be um erc7651 hey uh, first off, really appreciate the opportunity and, you know, excited to share more on, on what we've done. Um, so just to give a quick overview, um, quick description, uh, 7651 is effectively a specification for fractionally re represented NFTs within a single contract. Um, I did want to, before, you know, diving in more on implementation reasoning, uh, just call to attention some of the motivation behind this. Um, I think, you know, a lot of this is uh, sort of vested in recent product issues on within the NFT space, um, mainly illiquidity um, and mainly some, you know, headaches caused by past approaches to fractional representation. Um, you know, this is typically handled by, uh, by wrapping and resolving ownership through a secondary contract. Um, issues there are it, it's really difficult typically to get that fractional representation liquidity. Um, it's typically difficult to bootstrap these pools and it's not integrated um, deeply enough, I would say, to have the kind of effects that you'd see on like standard ERC-20s where, where you have really no liquidity issues for the most part. I mean, these are all typically illiquid markets, but not as much so as a standard NFT that say mints out for a for a set price, and you know after that it, it's totally up to um, an exchange like OpenSea or or Blur to kind of establish that liquidity. Um, anyway, in going into this, we really wanted to create something that worked out of the box. I mean, the ideal here would be having a specification that fully met both um, both seven twenty one and twenty, but of course this is this is totally impossible. Um, so we've shifted towards something that, you know, tries to adhere to some of these um, for the sake of already adopted standards, trying to meet those as well as possible. But, you know, it makes no claim to fully adhere to either. So we're, we're basically working on uh, shifting away to a basically non-compliant token standard, non-compliant new token standard. Um, now, the way this works is we, we effectively meet a lot of the existing 721 logic. So, you know, how IDs are represented, how IDs are tracked, how, um, how individual token transfers occur, but we also represent these tokens fractionally. So with decimals, as you might see in an ERC-20, um, we also meet those ERC-20 transfer approval functions. And um, in doing so, this is, this is really a, a point that I would like to see a lot of discussion on. I, I want to preface this by saying that, you know, we're, we're definitely not close to, to bringing this together as a published standard. I still think a lot of discussion needs to occur, especially on, um, <clears throat> on you know, like how, how, we're, uh, how we're handling some of these conflicts, how misidentification by other protocols might impact, you know, potential security vulnerabilities, and of course, what segments of this should be standardized and which should be left up to implementer because i do think we've we've introduced a, a few new ideas here but overall the gist of this is that it's it's effectively um an enumerated nft um, that can be transferred as an nft approved whatever meets those functions um, and then on the fractional representation side the the token can also be transferred approved like a fungible token and we've outlined um, some specifics on implementation that sort of uh, guide how, how transfers would actually actually function in practice and in implementation. Um, I think it might be best now to kind of jump into this, some, some discussion and, and maybe outline um, some more of the, uh, the spec. I'm not sure if anyone has immediate questions or, or maybe if you guys would like me to just go over um, some of the interface itself. I think William left some comments on this one. Yeah, so thanks, Acme. Um, thanks for sharing. I did read through it. I gave you some brief comments just looking at it. And um, 
the things I write first in my comments are the red flags. So please uh, be encouraged and disencouraged, uh, discouraged at the same time if you're reading them. I don't want to sound like an asshole all the time, but um, <laughs> that's how it, that's how it always reads. So sorry. Um, okay. So first of all, this is in the category of th there's a lot of ERCs out out there that are saying we don't we want to be compatible with ERC 721, but we we can't. That's there's a lot of them that are like that, and so. First, I really want to push you on that and say, are you ready to create the multi-billion dollar industry that is ERC-20 and 721 again? One off to do this. So if this is going to be in any way successful, and this, I want to spend a couple minutes on this because this applies to this one and the next proposal. But if you're going to create that entire ecosystem, great. It will not work with OpenSea. It will not work with Rarible. It will not work with any wallet that exists today. And it was really disheartening for me to realize how long it took to get MetaMask to support ERC 721, that was really sad for me. Like it took about four years to do that. I was like, really? In my opinion, this is like the only thing in NF NFTs are the only thing in blockchain that are legitimate. In my opinion, biased, right? But I'm like, it took four years to like get on board with the main application here. And so if we're not, if you're not gonna ride that train, that's fine. But I would like to see a significant commitment of resources available, including using your full name. I'm going to call that out. Using your name, having a team, having a lot of history. You know, there's, you've got to create a lot of track on this train as you're moving it. So this is something I would, I, I, this is not going to be successful as it is, what I'm trying to say. You've got really got to have a coalition to move something like this forward. Now, that's, that's what's just what I'm reading what's on the screen today. Going back to your motivation, I do think your motivation is on the right track. So I think that there might be other ways to work on this idea and mold it between you and the dual token, the other ERC. And so I think the motivation, you said it, and I listened to you, you said why you can't use wrap tokens. I want to challenge that. Why you can't use wrap token pools, which no one's even, I don't even, <clears throat> I don't even know you'd call that, but I'm just calling it a wrap token pool. Um, that's something you can do too, which would be compatible with ERC20, which would be compatible with 721 which would be compatible with OpenSea and wallets and all the things today. But I would really like to see you triple down on the motivation section here, and maybe we can help get this through. But I feel like a lot of people start with this, this and they, they have the motivation in their head, they don't write it down, and they're like, okay, therefore, we need to scrap everything and start over again with a new train track. So I just want to save you about four years, and I want to see this move faster. Um, I was hoping... And maybe you could tell me now, like, may, have you have you considered wrap token pools? Have you considered some of these other things? Um, is it really about the liquidity? You know, that should that should be the number one item. And, you know, we can wrap individual tokens, not pools, but, you know, there we go. Yeah, I think those are a lot of great points um, and definitely gives me a, a lot of a lot of points to jump off from and, you know, work on a few revisions to the uh, to the existing proposal. I, I know we also have. Um, a sample implementation that I would like to like to publish. I think that would be super useful as well. Um, but to touch on wrap tokens, um, on paper, it, it's something that should work totally fine. Um, there should be no issues with it. If a if say a collection launched with with wrap tokens immediately, um, it, it makes sense that it should be it, it should be something that that would work well. But in practice, I just don't think we've seen it take off um, to the same extent as you know a lot of this stuff recently has because that that little additional barrier um, to UX seems to have uh, have pretty significant impacts on how well these actually um, play out in production. Um, I think it, it impacts traction significantly as well whereas under this model and we have had a few production launches as well. Um, I, I was just kind of you know hesitant to to share those or touch on those because I don't uh, I don't want to be like advertising other projects within the proposal. Um, so that was one of my main concerns. Do there. it in the comments. Totally okay. do that, but do it in the comments. Got it. Got it. Sounds good. Yeah. All righty. I, I do have a few other of my own peer of comments, but I, I, I want to make sure that our next agenda item would get a chance, uh, get the full time. So uh, our next one is ERC7631. Uh, which is brought to you by vectorized dual natural do uh, token pair. Uh, and as it, the same thing, if you want to present, that's good too. Uh, if not, I can help you present 
everyone uh, uh, head over. Yeah. I, I think I have minutes. to share my screen. Yeah, go ahead and share your screen as you like. Um, yeah. Okay. And by the way, uh, for, for comments that is that we don't have time to address yet, uh, after these three main agenda items, we might have a few uh, more, uh, 10 more minutes uh, to discuss if uh, everything goes well. If not, then it's always good to do it uh, in a next session or uh, on offline uh, uh, comments. So go ahead, uh, vectorize. OK, I try to be brief. Thanks so much, Acme and William, for the comments and presentation. Okay, so uh, these are my contacts. You can contact me on Twitter for most res most responsive. Okay, so uh, basically, what is a dual nature token pair? So it's an ERC20 and ERC20721 that is somehow interlinked, uh, such that actions performed on one is auto-reflected on the other while preserving full standard compliance. So some example use case like fractionalization, automatic rewards, if you trade the ERC20, either games. Um, but I have to emphasize that this standard is a signaling standard. So we do not dictate how people will implement the accounting relationship between these two tokens. So uh, because it's a signaling mechanism, what is our goal? Uh, the first goal is to allow these tokens to show that they are interlinked. And the second goal, uh, which is optional, is because uh, if they are interlinked, Clicks on the ERC20 might trigger expensive ERC721 transfers, and we want to let the users automatically uh, like set whether they want the ERC721 to be minted to them. Uh, this is up to the implementation to enforce. If they don't want to enforce it, it's OK. So there are some similar uh, work on like signaling mechanisms, like royalty standard, dynamic traits. So uh, touching on the interface, this is to be implemented. So the ERC20 has to have this mirror ERC721 function, OK? Uh, this skippable function is optional. You, if you don't implement it in Solidity or Viper, uh, it's still compatible because these two methods are allowed to revert. And if you don't implement something, it will, the contract will revert if you call them. Uh, this must be implemented or the 721 side. So the 721 must say, what is the base ERC20 is linked to? OK, so what we want in the standard is we want it to be minimal, flexible, and easy to use so that it's easier to adopt. So uh, this rationale, uh, I've highlighted all these in the track. Um, OK, so and some safety considerations. Some of them is like uh, implementation specific. So it's not like. Uh, we are not detecting how people are going to implement their metadata, how they're going to implement their accounting. So these are just some suggestions that we hope that uh, implementers take note of. But the most important one is that because there are two contracts that talk to each other, they have to make sure that the functions that use for synchronization are only accessible to the other contract. So why standardize this signaling mechanism? Uh, for one, NFT marketplaces can show a URL to the ERC20 contract, and vice versa for DEXs, uh, ERC20 scanners, can show the URL to the ERC721 contract. And for analysis, uh, like analytics, token analytics, like Honeypot is, they can know that, oh, these two contracts are interlinked, so they won't mark uh, both contracts as honeypot when they see that due to the transfers of one, uh, some of the other tokens are automatically burned. They won't think that it's a honeypot behavior. And portfolio trackers can like know that these two are interlinked and avoid double counting asset values. So we are not saying that this is the, the one and best way. There are many alternatives uh, in the ecosystem that, and there's a lot of like adoption friction. So what we want is to like make the, the easiest uh, to adopt way, minimal friction. Um, and we know that ERC20 and 721, like, it's not compatible because of the function collisions, function initial collisions, and all those uh, logic. So for example, if I want to make a, a logic that depends on ERC721 balance off to be very exact, um, it's not possible within the same contract. And I think, yeah. So some of the pros is that it's like 100% compatible. So if you have a test suite for ERC20, you can just copy and paste across. Uh, 
no code changes. Some uh, of the problems is that it can be a bit challenging to implement. And because you have two contracts, end users have to know that, oh, there's an ERC20 and there's an ERC721. And also the ecosystem uh, with enough push, they might adopt better or newer standards over time. So uh, it's not like this is this will be here forever, but we just want to make uh, adoption easier. Okay, so some links. Yeah, uh, that's all for the presentation. Uh, now on to the questions. Yeah, anyone uh, want to give uh, vectorized and team feedback? Yeah, I okay. want to say something about the, <clears throat> the the problem that I see mostly is that uh, you you have, uh, since you have this dual token nature, what happens is you want to have one contract is the, the master, and there is another contract is like, say, the slave, that is the one that is actually the seven to one. In this case, you are uh, trying to make that uh, every relevant action happens in the master. So it's the, the uh, ERC-20 does all the operation. This choice is what caused, in my opinion, the big conflicts, because uh, why you don't just think to having uh, two intertwined the contracts, they are attached one to each other, but this one emits the event for the 7 to 1, and this one emits the event for the ERC-20, and you have solved the problem. You just need to think a way to make those two contracts uh, connected in a way that cannot be broken, you know? So you know those two contracts will be connected forever, but we know that this contract has its own logic, this contract has its own logic, and you solve the contract, and they remain fully compatible with the ERC-20, ERC-721. So have you thought about this possibility? Oh, yeah. Uh, so for our implementation, uh, we have an example in the DN404 GitHub, which is exactly uh, what you described. So the ERC-20 is the master contract. Uh, we call it the base contract uh, for convention. Uh, and the 721 is like a slave contract. So it just uh, emits the events and checks the, like do the safe transfer checks, but that's all. So all the state management is in the ERC-20 contract. Uh, but this standard doesn't say that uh, you have to implement the bug of logic in the ERC-20. You can choose to put it in the 721 if you want to do it. But uh, we just we are just suggesting that it is more convenient to put it in the ERC-20 contract. So we call it base contract. Yeah. But that is the that is point, that uh, as long as you have a base contract, because I understand why it's more convenient. Of yes. course, the, from a convenience point of view, is it is the thing is obvious. By the way, I took a look to the DN four hundred four, and it's a very well written contract. It's the problem is that as long as you keep that contract as the base and the other one as just a mirror, you have all these problems with compatibility. So you we cannot be compatible, and maybe in this case you should define some more. Uh, I don't know, find uh, some way to try to reduce these conflicts because, uh, you know, I haven't seen in the proposal any limitation, for example, that says, oh, you know, the the 721 ID cannot be more than uh, 100,000. That means that any small change implies that you are moving uh, uh, 721. That is, uh, it's, uh, how, how can I say, it's implied in the way how the DN404 has been implemented, but if there is no request in the in the ERC, that means that people have no idea. Say, I can decide to make a crazy number for the token ID, and then how can I manage, manage the process that is going to break it? Yeah, um, so the thing is that um, we don't want to like enforce how the accounting relationship between the tokens is because although i know like dn404 like has talked about all the edge cases but someone out there might like in one year or two years time come up with a better way to assign the token ids than me and i don't want this standard to stop that guy from doing that so yeah they might come up with some better way of assigning token ids than me so i don't know how what it, what is their way so I want to be uh, give them the flexibility. Yeah, I I I think you your pref your what you indicate is uh, it helps uh, future extendability. Um, yeah. Okay. 
I think we'll move on to the next item, and then hopefully after uh, all three of us, all three items uh, presented, okay. we'll have more time to sure. for additional feedback um, from from the group. And then now we'll be open up to every one of them. Um, so this next one will be ERC seven five three one resolving staked ERC seven twenty one ownership. Actually, all of them are ERC seven twenty one related. So go ahead. Uh, Sulo Francisco, uh, you want to present or not? Let me know. Sulo, I think you're you're muted. Or Francisco, Sulo, I think you're muted. Yes, uh, sorry, I I was muted, but I was trying to. Can you see the my screen? I'm just sharing the DRC basically, not. Uh, I don't have a presentation. What happened? Yeah, cool. We can see it. Okay, okay. So, um, let me make an introduction on uh, on the problem. The problem is is quite obvious that uh, when people have uh, NFTs, uh, uh, they are very reluctant to put them in a pool because they lose a lot of rights. For example, if you have a, a bored ape and you know the club is very, Yuga Labs is very active, they can give you eye drops, other stuff, whatever. But if you move your uh, ape on a, on a pool, you lose those, those, uh, uh, is nobody recognizes you anymore as a part of that club. And, and that is the simple scenario where you want to recover that possibility and say, okay, I have. Uh, uh, I'm staking this this token in a pool to get some reward, but I, at the same time I want to be recognized as the the holder of the right of ownership. So I am the owner. If there is an eye drop, you are not eye dropping the new token to the pool, but you I want that you eye drop the token to me. So the the biggest problem is that how you solve this issue without modifying the ERC seven two one because of course the. It would be much easier if, if you had some proposal that creates new events in the 721. But in most cases, those tokens already exist. So you, you cannot solve the direction. So the other the alternative is to solve in the pool. If the pool uh, emits events and has function, it say, okay, the I have, I'm the owner of the pool because I received the token actually. But the 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 user the wallet that has the right of ownership on this on this uh, token it's not me the pool but is the 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 person that basically deposited the 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 things on the pool you can tell the rest of the world uh, you can give a lot of information about what's happening and uh, so the, the the with a simple event you can solve the entire problem and there are also more complex cases i some friends are working, uh, the group is called the Roundtable. They are game enthusiastic and they help games to launch. Uh, and most of those games use the NFT as asset. And what happens is that uh, now they are trying to build a landing platform. So there are three actors that are involved there. The first actor is the game that is lending the asset to the beta tester. It is the second actor. And the third actor is the pool, the lending pool that manages the process. So you have three kinds of rights there. There is uh, the pool that receives the asset and uh, based on the 721, on the standard, it's the owner of the asset in that moment. But the game is uh, the one that has the right of ownership because it's just lending the token to a user, but still want to keep the right of the ownership. And on the other side, the user has the right of usage. So they can use that, uh, uh, that token as long as it's, uh, it's, lent to them, it's lent to them. So this is a, it's, it's, it's a situation where we have, right now, I can see clearly those two uh, Two cases that uh, I considered in the in the proposal, but most 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 likely there will be others that I don't see now. So the the basic idea was to have uh, how we can keep this flexibility at the same time create a proposal that can solve the problem. 
So the idea is that when the pool receives the, the assets, it meets this right sort of change event. Uh, I'm not, still not sure on the name, but you know the naming is always uh, some delicate stuff. And uh, when it meets the event, basically the event has to be emitted uh, at the time that the transfer event has been emitted or later. Why later? Because there can be pool, for example, I want to fix uh, a current situation. They did implement this. Now they do an upgrade. On this upgrade, they want to solve the issue. So they allow the user to register as the actual uh, right holder. And uh, that so as long as the event happens after the transfer event or, or at the same time, I think that the system works. And of course, any new transfer event will uh, override any uh, rights holder change because it means that the, the actual ownership has moved. And so new events m must be emitted in that case. Um, and uh, so the, initially the idea was that, okay, let's just talk about the ownership and then I realized that with these use cases, I was talking with those friends, th there is a right of usage. So uh, I decided to add this right, uh, bytes for rights, that is uh, an extra parameter that basically uh, uh, set up in this way allows you to have uh, an ex expandability of the, the, the proposal. It can be just is a magic number, basically, that right now is. Uh, it covers two specific use cases. In the future, can cover more, and the community can agree on. Okay, let's add this uh, this use case, this kind of right that is necessary. Uh, because as before was saying, uh, the other author is that you know it's always you want to keep the possible to expand the, the proposal to keep it open. So this is basically the uh, the the idea. Do you want to give the, the floor some time to respond to this? Uh, sorry? Do you want to ask people for feedback? Oh, yeah. If someone has any comment, of course, I'm, I'm here for feedback, you know? <laughs> yeah. So um, I shared some rel related uh, ERCs that I think may be relevant to it uh, that you can kind of take a look at. And uh, I also want to open this up to our uh, our group in the room to see if you guys have feedback for Francisco's. Uh, yeah. I had a quick question. So you had mentioned that board apes, for example, are going to do drops, benefits for people that own the apes. And they're not going to work if it goes to a pool. Do they want it to work if it goes to a pool? It would be nice right. to get some feedback from some of these people that are doing the token drops. Personally, I wouldn't want this. Uh, or let me, let me put this in mind. Some projects that care about liquidity and not having their assets in pools would not want to give tokens to people if they're in the pool. And not tracking the ownership separately is good for them. They align the interest of owning the liquidity and the token drops. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I don't do these very high-profile yacht party token drops, but this is something you might want to test. You might get invaluable feedback from them more yeah. so than this group here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That is, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's it's very important. I I, I talk to many games and projects that works mostly in the gaming industry, where is is where it's more dynamic. You know, because something like Bored Ape was just an example to introduce to the the proposal, but it's not really realistic because if you own a very valuable token, probably you are not going to stake anywhere. You don't trust them, you don't stake it. So it's not a real, in reality, it will happen rarely, okay? While instead, the case where I see more possibilities is in the game industry where people have a lot of NFT and they need those NFT to play, to move, whatever, but they want to have a, 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 they want to know the situation, you know, they want to know exactly what's happening to this NFT, who is the user right now, who is the owner, whatever, because there can be many other involvement in this case. And the game with which I, I talk to, they are very interested in this kind of, uh, and in fact, those people from the round table that are building this lending platform, uh, they they are, they work 
with like 20 metaverse game right now, something like this. And they think that is a, for them, there is a, a big use case for that. So I, I, I think maybe it's the introduction is, uh, is not the ideal because it was the first thing that I thought in the beginning. And later I realized it is more in that industry where there is the, you know, the more important. But of course, I, I think that uh, the ideal solution would be if the NFT meets this event, you know, that would be the ideal. But in that case, you are expecting that uh, someone has to deploy new events, a new token, you know, it uh, cannot be applied to any existing token. Cool. Alrighty. Uh, by the way, uh, well, thanks, uh, uh, Francisco. There is, a, there is a question. I think that. Yeah. Thanks, Francisco. Francisco. Uh, we are uh, now open up for a question and discussion for every uh, for all previous agenda item. Now you can either respond to Francisco's uh, uh, EIP seven five three one seven five three one or mm -hmm. any of the previous one. So now uh, the rest of twenty minutes are open to all. I saw that uh, Francisco Gio Giordano raised your hand. You want to go ahead? Yes, yeah, uh, ju just to reply to the the, um, the other Francisco's recent presentation. I, I think that's a very uh, clean and modular solution to the problem. Um, the kind of the extensibility of the bytes for argument is very interesting, but always when there is this kind of extensibility, I I wonder. How do you coordinate um, among the different projects or, or parties? What values and how to interpret them right? And I wonder if, if it's just an idea, if maybe there could be an additional part that allows the tokens themselves, if they want to opt in, to say, well, these are different kinds of rights that my token has, in addition to ownership and usage, uh, that the pool can then manage in some way if it wants to. So that would be like, if, if you understand what I mean, like a way to coordinate yeah, yeah. what are the, the valid uh, rights for a particular NFT. Yeah, I think that would be great, but still we go in the in the fields where we need to ask people to deploy new NFT. You know, you need to upgrade your contract, yeah. at least if it's upgradable. And, uh, and that update. was... It was what I I was trying to avoid to have a solution for existing NFT that don't force uh, you know the 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 owner of the NFT to to change them. But of course that makes a lot of sense. It's it, I, I think it would be great if it's the token itself the design. It's but maybe in that case it's better to make another proposal where you suggest a change. An extension to the seven to one, and th this extension includes those things directly at that level. You know, it's uh, I don't know, it's but it definitely uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think it could be made opt in like an optional uh, part of the token um, mm -hmm. in a way that is fully backwards compatible with existing NFTs. But anyway, that, that's just an idea. No, oh, I, I will think about it. It's uh, it's very interesting, and would make sense also the of the uh, the bytes for you know it's it's not arbitrary, but it's something that is defined in the in the token. You know, it's always a trade off between how much you want to ask the NFT to change compared with the standard, and how much you want to be completely open to you know. To any other possibility, and uh, but I will think about. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, both Francisco, Francesco. Um, I also say, uh, see a uh, quilt, a uh, quit, uh, raised your hand. Go ahead, quit. Yeah. Hey. Thanks, guys. Um, Francisco, I really like your idea. Uh, it reminds me of delegate XYZ, which is um, not standardized, but an existing protocol that lets people delegate rights for their NFTs to different wallets. And at the moment, we've seen some use, and I think you could probably 
take a lot of inspiration from that. Um, we've seen some use where protocols or pools that hold these assets on behalf of users will include delegation back to the user when they deposit. And then um, NFT projects or people that are interested in, in querying for ownership can read from the delegate registry and, and get the, uh, the staker. So that's something that's used in, in the real world. It's not an ERC and it's not standardized. It's kind of, uh, uh, you know, it can, it can change on the fly, which is uh, maybe not the best for, for projects. So it would be great to see that go and be, uh, and be standard, standardized through the EIP process. Um, but I think if you're looking for real world examples, there are plenty there and you can dig in and, and see how people are using Delegate. Yeah, by the way, I used the delegate when it was called delegate cash in the beginning. And uh, it's it's in that case, it's it's very smart. I think that that's the that was genius because they create a very small contract. The only thing it does associate one wallet to another. That is it. And they create the huge things on this super simple idea that I found totally genius. But yeah. uh, as you say, they didn't think about creating any standard because it was uh, somehow was uh, reducing the the power of their own proposal. You know, it that became a standard. Anyone can deploy a contract that pretend to be a delegation. You know, and that will uh, make less strong their own, uh, you know, uh, business proposition. But that I think that can be uh, standardized. I think it's it's it would be very simple to to create a standard for that. Yeah, no, I think you're totally right. And and if they've done anything, it's proved that there's certainly demand for this kind of thing. Yeah, in that case, it's very good because you are not moving at all your body dip. That by the way, you have a body dip. <laughs> We were talking yeah. about that, uh, and yeah. you don't touch that at all because you just delegate another wallet to say, "Oh, this other wallet is the one that I will use uh, everywhere to show that I am the owner of the body tape. It's it's very smart approach. It's yeah. Cool. Um, anyone else, uh, or I can line up there as well. Okay, uh, William, if you are responding the previous one, uh, you can. Uh, if not, then I want to open up a discussion with uh, uh, about the ERC seven six three one dual na uh, nature token pair. So vectorize. Uh, let me see if you're still here. Yeah. So vectorize. Yeah. My question for you is about skip NFT. So if two ad contracts are link interlinked to each other and the behavior needs to synchronize, how does um, the skip NFT break that behavior? Uh, because uh, one thing I raised this question is that in another app for the so-called Yasi 404, the Pandora ones, uh, I noticed that they're declared to have NFT under uh, 10K, but actually the, uh, the ID numbers exceed 10K. Uh, which is like a signal uh, that uh, the limit of IDs is different uh, is different than it was it it was originally intended. In DN four four, I haven't like deeply checked into this, but uh, what's your view on uh, having skip NFT? And do you think they can be made? I think last time I checked, it was it was mentioned as a as an uh, required uh, interface. Do you think they can be made made as okay. uh, optional? Um, so skip NFT is. Uh optional yes um why we implement it is because if two tokens are interlinked um let's say on l1 erc20 tricks can trigger like transfers of hundreds of erc721s or means of hundreds of 721s which is like crazy expensive at least two or three if guess so this uh feature is to allow people to they own the ERC20, so they can somehow claim the ERC22721 anytime they want. It's just that uh, they don't want to claim it now because the gas is high. So they can use it to permissionlessly uh, set the feature uh, to true so that they don't need to incur the NFT means. So it's optional. If the implementation wants to like 
regardless of what once you mean the NFT, it's up to them to do it. They are still compliant. They are just uh, giving a way for users to uh, to permissionlessly set this feature to save guests if they want. Okay. I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll follow up with you on that. I see that uh, three hands raised. Uh, I do want to uh, bring to the, uh, welcome Dan Finley uh, to the room as well. Uh, congrats on finalizing ERC1271 for a long time, uh, which also uh, leads to further efforts that you mentioned you're thinking about uh, the app permission. So uh, uh, Dan, just want to say hi. We'll uh, we're finishing up this part of discussion before uh, moving on to your presentation. I know that you have uh, you want to like share something. Um, so William, can you go ahead and 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 finish your question before we move on to Dan's? Hi, Vectorize. Good to meet you. Finally. Um, just on your presentation, I wanted to say great use case. It was very, I love the, that's why I'm, you, I'm immediately picking my phone like, Victor, are you recording this? We need these slides. Like I'm going to be tweeting the shit out of this, but okay. So vectorized every one of these standards is a producer and a consumer, right? So the fact that you spent so much ink focusing on the consumers of the information, top notch. So I want to see everyone doing that. <laughs> Not a question, just saying thanks. Okay, great. Uh, all right. Uh, I do want to uh, give uh, some, I know that uh, Quit and Zero X Acme raised your hand, uh, but uh, let me make sure that Dan has a chance to kind of quickly uh, bring the, the app permission, which is kind of related uh, in permission authorization and other things. Uh, so Dan, uh, do you want to shed some light on that? Uh, and then it could be a quick one. Yeah. Uh Hi, I'm kind of hearing myself echo. Is that normal? Um, I'm going to turn down my volume so I don't uh, distract myself. I'll turn it back up for any questions. Uh, just indicate. Um, yeah, so I uh, figure I might as well share a this a current state of a very high level standard. Um, I made I gave a couple talks at Dev Connect in Istanbul talking about. Uh, the need for a kind of new way of approaching the way dApps and wallets uh, interact, um, and in a way that I think is particularly friendly to smart accounts, and and I think in a way that can massively reduce many of the current phishing vectors that exist. Um, so one of the examples is that today we always connect the account before we ask the dApp to uh, make any further requests, and the requests are then always explicit actions the user should take. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share screen once I, once I'm ready to point to specific aspects. Um, and um, so with smart accounts, we've got an opportunity for dApps to initially request what they need, totally oblivious to what the user has. And this is, I think, important because today the user, the attacker basically gets full knowledge of the user's possessions and then kind of can craft their their proposal. And then the user, it's up to the user's wallet to try to decipher the action. So it's like, you know, memory unsafety where any process can, you know, interact with any other bit, except in an environment where, you know, the the user doesn't even necessarily know what every bit that they can interact with is. So we wanted to kind of flip that interaction on its head. What if the DAP had to make a request to say, this is the kind of thing I need. Um, for example, if you're going to do a swap on a, a you know Uniswap, they might say, I need an allowance from a token. You know, one problem Uniswap has had is managing token lists. But meanwhile, wallets actually have a custom list of tokens. So asking the user to choose a token and then let me swap in it, it's actually a nice open-ended way to put the token picking onto the user or the wallet side. Um, it reduces burden on the DAP, reduces the need for indexing, reduces the need for initially receiving knowledge about the user. And then in response, the user can provide some, uh, some payload that could authorize um, uh, some given action on behalf of their smart account. Um, so OK, so I'm, I'm going to jump in and, and show a current stage. So I'm going to keep it kind of high level, because there's actually a group in Portugal consisting of Pimlico, ZeroDev, Wallet Connect, and Coinbase, who is currently iterating on and trying to further define some things in here. Um, I think there are a couple um, parts they're kind of working through. So I don't want to jump straight to their version because um, uh, I think they're trying to work out their definition of provider and stuff. And so I, th I think I can keep it a little higher level, because I think some of the fine details are still being defined. Um, 
so I wrote um, a little blog post called Post Smart Contract Account DAP Permissions Flow. It's a mouthful. So you can find it at blogdanfinley.com. And um, in here, uh, basically, I, I break down where we are likely to make a set of standards to five steps. So there's probably going to be some new API call. And basically, treat all of these names as tentative. Um, we might come up with better ones. The DAP is going to ask for something that it needs. The shape of what it needs is going to be something that evolves a lot. So initially, it'll probably include uh, token uh, allowances and NFT allowances. Eventually, it could include you know things like vote delegation or uh, I don't know bridging or swapping or you know whatever actions are um, relevant to the user. I think it's important and critical that these be things that the wallet inherently knows how to represent to the user, and they can't just be crafted in a way that's confusing to the user. Um, and then uh, once the user has approved that. Um, they should be able to create a blob of some sort that allows um, the recipient to basically call uh, call a function on the user's account that includes that blob. And a user op may not be the right word here. Um, it would be uh, an action to take. So user op now has a kind of formal definition. This would be more like a message to send. Uh, so once once the user has returned a blob, and it may include some additional metadata to describe what the blob is, enables, um, but then the application would be able to perform actions from the user's account, much like token allowances, but in this case, going through the user's account, so preserving message sender and not relying on the authorization schemes of the token. Since one thing that we've seen is that uh, new tokens or new NFTs will sometimes introduce new permissions methods that are actually very dangerous. So like. Uh, ERC uh, 1155 brought in said approve all, and it was the only allowance method. And so now every time you grant allowance for a single NFT, you have to grant for all of your NFTs, and it's a Fisher's paradise. Um, if we enforce at the signer level, here are some safe things we might ever let you do, then uh, the application can do this through the wallet, and the wallet can always patch, uh, security patch, basically authorization schemes across the entire ecosystem at once. Um, uh, Right, so so the wallet oh, the wallet returns that blob to the DAP. I guess I kind of uh, conflated these, and then um, the DAP can then use that authority blob to either initialize a preferred in-app account management system, or it could potentially we could also expose um, uh, uh, the wallet could expose its own um, method of submitting these user ops. So here's we've got two uh, options here. So here's the flow. The DAP says, hey, can I get a permission? The wallet says, user, are you cool with that? If they say, OK, then the wallet returns this blob to the DAP. Now, there's two things the DAP can now do with it. One is it's either sending user ops on its own because it's been authorized to send user ops, and so they can send them straight to a bundler. Or uh, we could now have another method for proposing user ops to the wallet, which then uh, you know, they ask the user for permission. And you know, because the user may be paying for the gas in this scenario, this may also include a gas subsidy uh, parameter, in which case it may not require user interaction, but it's just trusting the wallet infrastructure to send to the bundler. I think that that's kind of kind of splitting hairs in here. The point is, once there's an authority blob in the DAP's hands, um, now the DAP has options. And actually, the DAP can pretty much it can send its own user ops. If there's any extra convenience methods that the wallet provides to allow it sending it, that's nice. Um, so here's the here's the proposal as zero dev and uh, Pimlico is currently working on it. So they've got a permissions standard. So the uh, the DAP would specify its own public key. Maybe maybe ERC twenty spending limit is one, um, and uh, maybe it specifies a specific one. I think there's benefit to letting the user pick one. Um, you know, I think what permissions gets uh, supported is a whole additional dimension of complexity once this initial uh, shape starts to take form. And then the wallet replies with, in this case, a permissions context. So there is some uh, some uh, some bytes. The permissions context is the bytes. That's what I call the author authority blob. In this case, they're providing some metadata for whether this was res responding positively to the permissions that were requested earlier. And then also, they've they've added some nice stuff where you know, if this is a counterfactual smart contract account, then the DAP will be able to initialize it. I'm proposing they make this an array instead because the contract could also have a series of upgrades it might need to uh, to execute. They're saying it would need the DAP would need to take those ops. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do think uh, yes. <laughs> the answer to Conrad is yes. Um, okay, and then um, 
And then finally, and then where where I think this is getting particularly complicated, they're then trying to also handle the relaying of the user op uh, on behalf of the DAP from the wallet. And I think, like like I was pointing out before, I think that this is getting into the like strictly optional zone. And um, and once we have that initial context, the DAP is massively empowered, and there's a lot of ways we could do it from there. So I I would almost love for us to just just get these two standards first. And you know, you know, let let DApps send their own user ops first, and you know, then we can take our time a little bit more with uh, if DApps are going to be um, asking the wallet to relay their stuff or ask it to while offering to subsidize. Because if they're offering to subsidize, why aren't they just broadcasting to the bundler? I don't know. I think there's a little bit there's a little bit of extra complexity happening um, over here. There, see, they were. Um, uh, oh, it looks like they started simplifying it a little bit. Oh, this is maybe not the latest version. Uh, so anyways, um, there's a little summary of it. I, I think it's exciting because it's both something where like I've kind of been talking about it for a few months and then also there's very active development uh, on this. And so uh, I'm excited to see it evolve. And um, hopefully um, with this kind of new boom of smart uh, accounts and things, um, we've got an opportunity to make a much more safe model for interacting with dApps. Okay, I'm turning up my volume again. Sorry if anyone was trying to interrupt me while I was looking at my screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan. That's very, very helpful. I, I know that uh, this is an evolving uh, conversation. Uh, you thought it was stable enough to present, uh, but uh, a, a day ago, you realized that uh, there's a lot more added in this working group. So that's wonderful. Uh, I, I think that's the whole point, purpose of having this conversation because, in fact, before you were here, uh, Francesco Sulo was presenting a, uh, a an ERC about rights uh, so that you can stake NFT and still get some rights. And then a feedback from Francesco Gian, uh, Giardano, uh, the, uh, who is also in the room, the uh, Open Zeppelin lead dev before, uh, he said, like, it would be even nicer if we can have a way to coordinate, to declare what kind of rights uh, is, is available. And so I think these are all like very re uh, uh, related to each other. Uh, the, the whole point is to bring attend, bring people's awareness to kind of the potential opportunity co to collaborate. Uh, two other value, I, I don't know if you have presented. One is uh, WalletCon, you already did, but uh, the, all, the All Wallet Devs is a biweekly call run by, oh, it's a, a uh, four week uh, per, uh, per month call run by Samuelson. I think that's a good group of people who can use a lot of knowledge uh, in this effort. And also, are you aware of the new effort e ETH debug lead by uh, G Nick Dan, uh, who was previously the uh, the Truffle Suit main maintainer? He now joined ETH, uh, ETH Foundation and run an effort of ETH debug. One effort the group is working on is schema declaration for easy debugging. I think when you mentioned authorization blob, that's what I could, uh, I think, uh, being able to have user visibility to the content they're signing into, but also across the building tools, uh, debuggability of what is sent to user, what user actually say yes to in a more uh, machine readable and human readable way could be a good thing to have. So I can send you uh, those link if you're interested. I think uh, they can also benefit of knowing this and also maybe give feedback or we'll collaborate. Cool. Yeah, I, I haven't gotten the very latest on ETH debug from Gnin, but um, he's an old friend. So I'll, I'll catch up on that. Yeah. And William, uh, I, I saw you raise your hand. Hi. Hey, Dan. What's good? Good to see you. Um, I got a few notes here, rapid fire. Um, First, regarding what should be in scope for the first spec, how much how much uh, field you want to lay out, I think it's very important that there be a path to the finish line. So if there's a blob, I would, I mean, strictly speaking, if we're going to standardize something, we should have a producer and a consumer. So I would like to see a consumer, even if it's not standardized, use that blob for something valuable. Otherwise, why are we standardizing this? That's just an application-specific EIP, which nobody likes. So, yeah, I 100% I agree. I think that as defined in the, the blog post that I sent, uh, or I was sharing, the authority blog is already sufficient to send user ops within the bounds of the authorization. And I think that that's a completely reasonable, minimum viable version of this. I think the thing I was saying could be a later scope is whether the wallet helps in broadcasting or exposes a method for specifying a paymaster to subsidize with an 
And th there's a lot yeah. of complexity you could bite on that I, I think we can possibly push out. Um, I've wanted to, yeah, so that's just the composability of, of a spec in general. This is something I'm working on. I'm working on a similar project just for tokens. Uh, and there's, we're, we're adding a little dangerous element. We're adding a new way of signing, a new way of uh, authorizing things that can hit the wire. And so we haven't done this in a really long time, right? We have EIP 712 and we have Ethereum proper. Like that's all we've got. We've got these two ideas since the beginning. So this is adding a third way of doing that. And I'll just lay this idea out there. But for, for what I'm working on, we actually have an EIP that has a GUI spec. So bear with me. It actually specifies the behavior that needs to be in the user visible wallet. And here's why is because the wallets will need to remember these blank checks that we're writing. We're writing actionable transactions that can't be canceled, right? So for transactions, you can cancel any transaction by just rebroadcasting that same nonce. And so that's the safety that's, it's default safe. We're adding new stuff that's default dangerous, right? So I wanted to think about that. Now, specifically because wallets are not stateful, you can delete the wallet off your phone and you can reinstall it and everything comes back. It re-indexes whatever centralized or not, but it gets everything back onto your phone or your device back where it was. That can no longer happen. This is a major change that I think you understand because you've made commitments that you've signed that are out in the matrix. And if you delete it off your phone, they're gone. So it makes Ethereum plus this a little bit more like Zcash than like Ethereum. And so again, you and me get this, but it changes the way that people interact with their devices. Me personally, I delete my phone all the time. I wipe it. I wipe it every time I go to China. I wipe it every time I cross a border. I wipe it every, right? I have a computer. I have a separate computer for travel. I have a, this is OPSEC. And none of that works with this proposal because you need to now store all of your signatures. It's just like zero knowledge proofs. You've got to keep things locally. And so I think this proposal fails unless the wallets do that because you're going to get phone calls. You're going to get death threats like me. Um, I lost everything because I did this and, you know, I deleted my account and then I reinstalled my account and now everything's gone. Well, yeah, because you, you listed your board ape for sale at one ether 20 years ago, and now it's worth a lot more than that. Somebody found it, you know, and then they played that transaction. So I just, I just wanted to scare you a little bit. Like we're, we're doing some dangerous things here that affect a lot of the ecosystem. And for me, that's even MVP. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's very reasonable. I think specifying backup for these, if these if these payloads are capable of doing things on the user's behalf, then we need some mandatory data availability for them. Um, I but think this that's is crazy because EIPs don't do GUI. So hmm. if for me, yeah, ERCs, ERCs could. EIPs and ERCs never specify the way that the pop-up needs to look in MetaMask. That's not a sure. thing. So sure. I'm saying we got to change that and you know we'll just do what we got to do. I think they might specify what data is relevant to re to present to the user at the very least. I, I don't think that's unheard of. I think being overly prescriptive might be, um, but I don't think that's what you're proposing. I think saying yeah, I just firmly, need stateful. Yeah, I think saying stateful. I think it's very reasonable, at least in the security consideration section of the spec or something like that. I think that's, that's, I think that's all very good discussion, uh, and then we do need to kind of. Uh, uh, present those to our future ERC, like whether ERC should be able to kind of info, uh, specify what to show to user. Uh, we don't currently have that. I don't have not seen that, but I think that's too, totally uh, reasonable to assume. Um, I do want to like call to the attention that our meeting is uh, a little bit over time. Uh, I was, I hope that I was able to try uh, to get back to zero X uh, Acme who raised the hand and killed, uh, but it seems like we're out of time. Uh, I do want to like use one last chance to say uh, this is a biweekly call. We're rotating between two time zones, and uh, next time we still look for uh, for uh, agenda items. We also want to uh, discuss as a group how can we bring more people together. How can we acknowledge and recognize contributions? How do we encourage adoptions? Those are all open questions. We hope we get a chance to discuss in the future. Um, but other than that, I hope that uh, if you haven't joined us, um, take a photo, scan, uh, join our uh, main repo. Um, 
I'm deeply grateful for people who contribute their time to either either authorize uh, author a ERC or just come here to help other people author better ERCs. We anticipate this will be the next generation of IETF that enable uh, internet. Uh, so that's the general idea. Um, I thought someone raised their hands the last time. Okay, uh, if not, uh, I want to make sure that you guys can go on to your other meetings. Uh, see you next time. I really appreciate your coming. Thank you, William. Thank you, Dan. Dr. Rice, Acme, whoever presents. Uh, and also thank Adrian uh, and uh, Amadi. Oh, you have a, you raise your hand? Okay, yeah, all righty. Thank you very much. And also thank our staff member, uh, Lily. Uh, and we wish to be here with you next time. That's it. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, please. Thanks. Victor, I had a quick question for you. Let me kick off uh, the, the, the bots so that everything yeah. else could be off record and then we can chat.